3D video games use 3D models. I know how obvious that is, but it's relevant for what I'm going to attempt today. See, even the early pioneers of 3D gaming used hundreds of 3D models, like Super Mario 64, which has a wide variety of models for actors and stages. But I'm going to do something nobody dares to do. Not because it's scary, not because it's difficult, mostly because, frankly, it is quite stupid. I'm going to make a short playable game in Godot with only one 3D model. Let's lay down some ground rules. The character, environment, enemies, every visual in this game will be made of this one model. I'm leaving a bit of wiggle room to allow for multiple exports of things like different armatures. Secondly, to emulate an average crunch day at the job I don't have, I'm only allowed to spend 8 hours on this. Obviously, you can only do so much with one model, and I think I'll explore most of the options in this time period. Finally, the main goal of this challenge is to push myself to learn Godot's 3D engine more, so no easy cop-out game types like Walking Simulator or Tic-Tac-Toe. I'm making a 3D platformer whether I like it or not. So, without further ado, let's take a look at the model we'll be using today. Now, for the clever people in the audience, you might have considered the possibility of making a voxel game by using a cube as the base model. And my response to that is, yeah, you could do that. That's kind of boring, and it feels kind of cheaty as well. So instead of using the Blender default cube or some similar shape, I'll be going with something different. I had a few ideas prior to this, and I think I'll be going with a star shape, with a circle in the center. Aside from having a unique shape with two different colors to work with, it invites some interesting concepts for the game that will be revealed later because of this unique shape. So yeah, this model will make up every object in this game. Now that that's settled, let's set up a basic 3D environment in Godot to see it in action. I'll start by setting up a rudimentary player controller with basic environment collision. I've not worked that much with 3D and Godot. Oh wow, that was actually quite easy. Alright, game's done. No main scene. <laughs> no camera means no game. Alright. Bang! What a great game. This itself did not take too long, and the product is something to say the least. Alright, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. Yes, this coat sucks. It's just temporary. I forgot to add the player to the scene. Bang! What a great game. <laughs> what a good game. Oh, okay. Yay! <laughs> what a good game. With that groundwork laid, it's time to start the process which will eat up the most time out of my 8 hours. The character model. When I had decided on the star model, I had some neat ideas for the player character, both in terms of look and animation. The fundamental idea is a human-like character that slides across the ground on spinning stars, and throws stars off his arms to attack enemies. While making this model, I used a few interesting tricks, like scaling and shearing a star into a mouth shape, using different materials to switch out colors for what I needed, and using a few stars in unconventional ways for detailing. And just like that, after a few minor tweaks, the model was finished. I think I'll call him... Starman. <laughs> Starbound. Restar? Star Craft? Sea of Stars. Star Low. Sly Star? Okay, Sly Star it is. Because he slides on the star. Which, that animation is what I need to do next, actually. But before that, let's throw the base model in game and see how it looks. It looks super stiff, and it moves terribly. Awesome. Let's, uh, let's fix that. Back in Blender, I start setting up a rig for this dude. 
Okay, blunder tip number one I've learned is if you ever want to add a bone after object weights to add a vertex group for it, just name it the same as the bone and it will be that weight. Man, it's so nice to be able to move bones. Can't do that in Mario 64. Notably, I make a huge mistake here that ends up costing me a large amount of time. Remember that YouTube short I made about setting up inverse kinematics and how I'm always reluctant to do it? Yeah... Actually, I think I should explain IK real quick. Inverse kinematics are a 3D animation technique used to set a bone chain's position and rotation based on a goal point, most commonly used for legs. It achieves this by bending and rotating along the length of the chain, which simulates the bending of a joint. Anyways, back to me animating without that helpful technique. I'll realize soon enough that I should really set it up. <sighs> I think I'm gonna learn from my past mistakes and actually set up an IK rig this time. And then, after that realization, I set it up completely wrong. It didn't seem like a huge issue at first, but I chose to make the IK goals in Blender objects instead of bones within the armature. While the animation would be the same regardless of which one I used, it's multiple animations that would show a problematic difference between the two. See, in Blender, animations are stored per object instead of across the scene. When I switched off the idle animation to start making the run animation, I quickly noticed that the IK objects were not switching their animation with the armature. I ended up playing around with this for way too long, messing up the two animations I had done so far along the way. Uh, I remember why I hate setting up IK. Eventually I realized this wouldn't do, and I scrapped the IK objects in favor of IK bones in the armature. So I had to redo the whole IK system. Uh, the old one was not playing nice with multiple animations, and it's probably better to just have the IK targets in the same rig anyways. So instead of using objects, I'm using bones now, which is probably a much better way to do it, like all things considered. Anyways, time to get back to making that animation. Now, when I switch animations, the IK bones switch alongside the armature like I wanted. Now that that's done, I can finally finish the idle animation, and the walking animation. I like how the star slide turned out. Now to see them in-game. Nice. Obviously the animation snapping is pretty bad, but this is pretty good so far. Time to adjust the speed based on player velocity. Holy crap. <laughs> oh my god. He is absolutely moving. And hey. That's actually looking decent so far. Let's add a jumping animation and a jumping action to the game. Nice. This has a decent bit of jank at the moment, what with the snapping and all. Godot has a few options to resolve this, most notably the animation tree node. However, there's a slight problem. I have no idea how to use this node. See, in the 2D game I'm working on, proper announcement coming soon. Animations are easy because pixel art is naturally snappy, but snapping in 3D looks pretty bad if done wrong, and this looks bad. So it's time to spend even more of my 8 hours learning how animation blending works. And here I make another mistake that I roll with. Originally I wanted to use animation state machine, as it looked like a cleaner flow graph, but the tutorial I was referencing used animation node blend tree more readily. I end up disliking this way of doing things, as it felt quite clunky to me for this project, but at the very least I learned how to use it. Anyways, each action has a separate interpolation value between an animation and the rest of the graph. 
After a long trouble of implementing this, with some bad code and minor code cleanup, it was finally implemented properly. Along the way, I make many miscellaneous tweaks to the engine. Now, it's still jank, but I'm running a little low on time for everything else. It's best to move on for now and create some level geometry. Again, this was a turbulent process. Originally, I thought I would be smart by blocking out the level geometry in Blender and using the shrink wrap and array modifiers to glue a sheet of the model to it. This did not work out. I should just be able to add a shrink wrap to you. That did not work nearly as good as I hoped it would. Oh my god. I mean, it's kind of working. So instead, I did it manually. A big time waste later, I imported the visual model, as well as the vertices of the blocked out model to use for collision only, as to not break the challenge's rules. This looks awful. Let's make it look a bit less bad. See, one other preconceived thought I had going into this challenge was that shaders would absolutely carry the visuals. I don't have enough time left to write my own, and I don't know how, but there are a wide variety of open source shaders I can use for this. I didn't mention it earlier, but I threw this outline shader onto Slystar to make him pop more, which really helped. Choosing a shader for the level wasn't as simple. I ultimately ended up on this Laserdisc-esque shader, which completely changed the look of the level. At the time it seemed like a good decision, but looking back on it, maybe not a great choice. But there was no time, as I only had an hour and a half left to add attacking, enemies, and moving platforms. So begrudgingly, I moved on to adding moving platforms and cleaning up movement code, which actually did not take too long. We need a way to fight back. Let's make an attack action for the animation I made earlier. And make it shoot a star projectile forward. And bam. That was not too bad. Thankfully, adding enemies was something I was confident in. I already wrangled a lot with Godot's hitbox systems, and luckily 3D was no different from 2D in that regard. Let's populate the level with these enemies now, and add a goal area at the top. We also need some physics changes. Oh, and the enemies should probably have some death projectiles. And just like that, I have 8 minutes left. Let's just wrap up the game with a simple victory screen. And here it is. A short game constructed out of just one model. It's missing a lot of stuff that games normally have, like music, sound effects, variety, polish, multiple levels, credits, an intro, a tutorial, skill, polish, health, fun, story, polish. But you know what? That doesn't matter. This was a short project meant to push me to learn more about Godot's systems, and I'm glad I did it. 
If I allowed myself more time, I doubt I would have pushed as hard as I did to learn new techniques. And I probably wouldn't have even finished it, honestly. So even if it is rudimentary and not very fun, it was an interesting idea. Thank you all for watching, and hopefully you enjoy this kind of content. I have a lot of ideas for challenges that will push me to learn more about 3D modeling and game development, so hopefully making videos about it will give me enough motivation to pull through on them. In terms of learning new things, short projects small in scope are definitely the way to go. And the links to the resources I used will be in the description. Until then... Oh, let's go. This game is terrible.